we start this lecture with an overview, a plan for what will be presented. In this pre-lecture, we will begin our study of waves. We will start by discussing a specific type of wave, the transverse harmonic wave on a string, to introduce the general principles. In particular, we will develop the relationship between the speed of the wave and its frequency and wavelength. We will develop a mathematical expression that describes the displacement of the transverse harmonic wave as a function of space and time. We will then apply Newton's second law to a string under tension to obtain the equation that holds for any wave on a string. We will then demonstrate that our expression for the transverse harmonic wave is a solution to this equation, with the velocity of the wave being determined totally by the tension in the string and its mass density. Finally, we will demonstrate that the harmonic wave on a string carries energy that is determined by the amplitude and the frequency of the wave. In the last two pre-lectures, we have studied various systems oscillating with simple harmonic motion. We will now consider systems made up of many objects that are coupled together and will study what happens when these systems are driven so that each part of the system is undergoing simple harmonic motion. Here we see a very long taut string laying on a horizontal frictionless floor. As we move one end of the string back and forth, we see a pattern propagate down the string. Note that the motion of any point on the string is the same as that of the end of the string. It simply moves back and forth perpendicular to the string. The only difference is that it reaches a maximum displacement somewhat later, since it takes time for the pattern to propagate. This simple picture captures the essence of the physics we will be studying for the rest of this pre-lecture as well as the next. The key observation is that even though there is clearly a pattern or a wave that keeps moving along the string to the right, the string itself is not going anywhere. Any part of the string that we focus on just moves back and forth about a stationary equilibrium position. The string is merely the medium through which the wave travels. Indeed, we will soon see that the speed of the wave is determined totally by the characteristics of the medium. For example, here we see the ever-popular stadium wave, often seen at sporting events. The wave travels around the stadium, but the people that make up the wave do not. They simply stand up and sit down again as they follow the lead of the people next to them, just as one point on the string follows the lead of the point next to it. In the case of the stadium wave, the people are the medium in which the wave travels. In the examples of the stadium wave and the string, the motion of any part of the medium at any given time is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave moves. Consequently, we say that these waves are transverse. We will now quantify some characteristics of the wave we introduced on the last slide. We'll start by creating the harmonic wave. Namely, we will move the end of the string just as a mass oscillates on a spring. How must this expression change if we want it to represent the motion of a point some distance from the end of the string? Well, the amplitude and frequency of the motion will be the same, but the actual displacement will lag behind that of the end of the rope. We can account for this difference by simply adding a negative term to the argument of the cosine function. To check that this form works, just consider phi to be the value of omega t when the point in question first reaches its maximum value. The argument of the cosine will be zero, and the displacement will be maximum at this time. Let's now consider a point twice as far from the end as the first point. Clearly, the negative constant we need to add to describe the motion of this point will be twice as big as that for the first point, since it takes twice as long for the wave to reach that point. Therefore, we can write an expression that works for all points on the string by setting phi equal to k times x, where x is the distance of the point from the end of the string, and k is a constant called the wave number. 
If we freeze the wave at any given time, we see the shape of the wave repeats itself over and over as we move along the x-axis. The distance it takes for the pattern to repeat itself is called the wavelength, and we denote it by the Greek letter lambda. Since a cosine repeats whenever its argument is increased by 2 pi, we can obtain the relationship between the wavelength and the wave number by setting k lambda equal to 2 pi. We now have obtained the general expression for the displacement of a transverse harmonic wave on a string traveling along the positive x direction. It is customary to swap the order of the two terms in the argument of the cosine so that the term containing x comes first. We will now examine the form for the harmonic wave we obtained on the last slide in more detail. Here we see the displacement of a string as a function of time as a wave travels on it in the x direction. If we focus in on any specific piece of the string, we see that it is just moving from side to side with simple harmonic motion with frequency omega. The time it takes any piece of the string to make one complete oscillation is related to the frequency in exactly the same way we found when studying simple harmonic motion. We will use the symbol P to represent the period of the oscillation of the waves on a string so that we can use T to represent the tension in the string. If we now freeze this animation at t equals zero, we see a harmonic wave along the x-axis whose amplitude and wavelength are easy to identify. The wave number k is obtained simply from the wavelength. If we focus on any piece of the string, we see that exactly one wavelength passes through it as it makes one complete oscillation. In other words, the wave has moved one wavelength along the string during one period of its oscillation. The speed of the wave is therefore just the wavelength divided by the period, which can also be written as omega over k or as f times lambda. So what have we learned so far? We have made a plausible conceptual argument that if we drive the end of a string from side to side with simple harmonic motion, then all points in the string will eventually be moving with simple harmonic motion as the wave propagates along the string. We have obtained an expression for the displacement from equilibrium of any part of the string at any time, and we have seen how the speed of the wave is related to its period and the wavelength. On the next two slides, we will apply Newton's second law to obtain this exact form and to determine how the speed of the wave depends on the tension and the mass density of the string. Here we see a wave traveling on a string. We'll freeze the picture and focus in on one tiny element of the string. We will assume that the tension in the string is the same everywhere along its length and that the displacement of any part of the string from equilibrium is small compared to the wavelength. This second assumption enforces the requirement that the angle that any part of the string makes with the x-axis will always be small, which will simplify our calculation. In order to apply Newton's second law, we will need to determine the net force on a small element of string. The net force in the x direction is the difference in the x components of the tension on either side of the string element. Since the cosine of a small angle is very close to 1, this difference will be close to 0, and the net force on the string element in the x direction vanishes. The net force in the y direction is the difference in the y components of the tension on either side of the string element. Since the sine of a small angle is very close to the angle itself, this difference will just be the tension times the difference in the angle on either side of the string element. We can now apply Newton's second law to the string element in the y direction. We know the net force and we will write the mass of the element as the product of the length of the string and mu, its mass density. The resulting expression then relates the product of the tension and the derivative of the angle of the string with respect to x to the product of the mass per unit length and the acceleration. 
Since we want to end up with an expression for the displacement y as a function of x and time, we want to eliminate the angle theta from this expression. Now, tangent of theta is just equal to dy dx. Since we've assumed theta to be small, we can approximate tangent theta as just theta. Therefore, we can replace d theta dx in our expression by the second derivative of y with respect to x. On the next slide, we will obtain the desired wave equation by rewriting this expression in terms of the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time. On the last slide, we use Newton's second law to obtain an expression that relates the acceleration of an element of the string to the second derivative of its displacement with respect to x, which is just the curvature of the string. Therefore, we see that the net force on an element of string is proportional to the curvature of the string. The net force then acts as a restoring force since it always points back towards y equals zero. Now, the acceleration can always be written as the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time. When we make this substitution into our equation that we obtained from Newton's second law on the last slide, we arrive at a general equation that holds for all waves that can be supported in a string. We will now verify that the form we have previously obtained for a harmonic wave is a solution to this general equation. Here we see the form for the displacement of a harmonic wave as a function of space and time. The wave moves with constant speed related to the period and the wavelength. Differentiating the displacement twice with respect to position gives us back the original function times minus k squared. Differentiating the displacement twice with respect to time gives us back the original function times minus omega squared. Therefore, we see that our form for the harmonic wave is indeed a solution of the equation as long as the ratio of omega to k is equal to the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length of the string. Now we know the ratio of omega to k is the same as the ratio of lambda to p, which is equal to the velocity of the wave. Therefore, we have obtained the important result that the velocity of the wave on a string is determined totally by the tension in the string and its mass per unit length. The velocity is indeed determined by the medium. It does not depend on the frequency, the wavelength, or the amplitude of the wave itself. For example, if we double the frequency of a wave, its wavelength will decrease by a factor of two, keeping the speed of the wave the same. On the last slide, we obtained the important result that the speed of waves on a string depends only on properties of the string itself, namely its tension and its mass per unit length. This result follows from the fact that Newton's second law in this case produces an equation known as the wave equation that states that the second derivative of the displacement with respect to space is proportional to the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time, where the constant of proportionality is given by 1 over the speed of the wave squared. This equation is the defining equation for waves. The characteristic speed of the wave is determined by the constant in this equation. This constant will always depend only on the properties of the medium for the wave. For example, for sound waves, the medium is the air, and the speed depends on factors like the air pressure and temperature, as well as the properties of the molecules in the air itself. The fact that the speed of the wave does not depend on the wavelength or frequency of the wave should be consistent with your experience. For example, you know that sound waves of all frequencies must travel at about the same speed since a person talking to you from down the hall sounds about the same as he would standing right next to you. 
The sounds from a distance will be quieter, but the voice, which is made up of both high and low frequencies, will still sound the same. We'll close this pre-lecture by considering one more important quality possessed by waves, their ability to transmit energy from one place to another. Clearly, energy is needed to start the wave. If we consider the wave on a string as an example, we know the string will possess kinetic energy since it has mass and the passing wave causes its elements to move. Indeed, we can see how this energy will scale with the frequency and amplitude of the wave by obtaining an expression for the velocity of an element of the string by differentiating, with respect to time, our expression for its displacement. Just as we found when studying simple harmonic motion, we see that the maximum velocity of an element of the string is equal to the product of the frequency and the amplitude of the wave. Therefore, the maximum kinetic energy of any element of the string is proportional to the square of this product. This result is, in fact, general, holding for all kinds of waves. We have just determined the scaling behavior for the kinetic energy of any piece of our string. We now will demonstrate the energy moves down the string in the same direction as that of the wave. The key here is to realize that each element of the medium is driven by the one just before it. Here you see a hand pumping the end of the string from side to side. As the hand moves, it exerts a force on the string in the direction of its motion. Therefore, the hand always does positive work on the string, causing the kinetic energy of the string to increase. We see this increase of energy since more and more of the string moves as the wave propagates down the string. As the wave moves down the string with a speed v, so does the energy. So far, we have considered only harmonic waves in which the particles in the medium oscillate with simple harmonic motion, and as a result, the waves themselves can be represented by a sinusoidal function of space and time. Next time, we will show that all waves are not represented by sinusoidal functions. Indeed, a function of just about any shape at all will satisfy the wave equation as long as it represents motion with a constant speed. We conclude with a brief discussion of the main points of this pre-lecture. First, we introduced the transverse harmonic wave on a string. We determined that the speed of the wave is given by the product of its wavelength and its frequency. We obtained a mathematical expression that describes the displacement of the harmonic wave as a sinusoidal function of space and time. Second, we applied Newton's second law to a string under tension to obtain the equation that holds for any wave on a string. We then showed that the transverse harmonic wave is a solution of this equation with the velocity of the wave being identified as the square root of the tension in the string divided by its mass density. This result holds for any wave on a string not just for transverse harmonic waves. Third, we discussed the energy that propagates in the wave and discovered that its maximum value was proportional to the square of the product of its amplitude and its frequency.